Hi there, welcome to the second half of Web 2.2.2 and um, my name is Dave Humphrey. I'm going to be taking you through the second, second part of the course and in this part of the course we're going to be doing a lot to start to take the knowledge you had from the first half of the course and use it to build dynamic web pages. We're going to move away from um, just talking about JavaScript and so on and talking about how to do JavaScript in the context of HTML and CSS and how to bring all those things together. So if we take a look at what you've done up till this point, everything you've done to this point is going to come into play in what we're going to do. Even today, I'm going to make use of all of it. So you've been learning how to work with JavaScript to program strings, numbers, arrays, objects, all the built-in types that JavaScript has available to it. And you've been able to build programs to, um, to do similar kinds of things that you would do in C, for example. What we're going to do now is we're going to transition into working on aspects of the web that are really specific to the browser environment. So up until this point, as I say, you've been working with strings and numbers and arrays. And how is that different than other programming languages? What is it about JavaScript and the web that's different? Well, we're going to find out that what the web provides is a really rich series of APIs or application programming interfaces. This is a set of objects, methods, uh, that we can use properties to access and control what happens in a web page. So our focus today is going to be on learning how to make a web page dynamic, uh, program the page, modify aspects of it, insert things, remove things, and make it something that's alive at runtime. Okay, so just uh, in order to, to get us there, let me let me start by um, let me start by reviewing a couple of things that I think are important. So just some terminology things for what we're about to do. So you know from your work that we can create an object O, for example, O is an object, and we can set properties on O. So I could say O dot X is equal to ten. And I can access x, and I'll get back the value of 10. So x is a key or a property name that lives on O, and 10 is a value that lives on O. And we also know that in addition to putting a, a primitive type, like a number, onto O, we could as well, we could say O.f is equal to a function. And this function might return the string hello world, like so. So O at F returns a function. So the reason I want to I want to make this clear is because in a moment we're going to start working with the DOM and with the APIs of the DOM, which are a, a set of objects and properties that are available to us. And it's going to become really important that you understand the difference in how some of these things are going to be exposed to you. So if I wanted to invoke that function, if I want to call that function, we have to say o.f, o.f returns the function reference to me, so now I have access to this, but I have to use the invocation operator and I have to invoke that function, and so now I can say I want to call the function f, which is present on object o, okay? And we see this with, um, with built-in types as well. So for example, if we said we have an array and we can access the array's length. So the array's length is initially zero. We could call a method on the array. We could push one into the array. We could push two into the array. And the length of the array is now two because we have two elements in there. If I say array.push, I'm getting back a function. So I'm getting a reference to the function um, as opposed to calling the function. If I want to invoke the function, array.push, and I have to invoke the function like so. So I want to be clear about, about that because we're going to be using so many objects, and some of these objects are going to have properties which are... Uh, we can read them or we can set them, and some of them are going to be functions and so on that we have to retrieve, and we'll try and keep that clear as we're going through. One last thing just to point out, and that is, you know by convention that um, 
constructor functions typically are going to be named with a capital and we're about to encounter a lot of constructor functions. So we just saw one a minute ago when we said array. Array is a function and it's a special kind of function. It's a function that's meant to be called with the new operator in order to generate a new instance of the array prototype. So we have, we have these sorts of functions as well. So when we're going through this, I want you to really uh, remember or hang on to the knowledge that you had in what you learned about JavaScript and, and in terms of working with objects, working with constructors, properties, methods, etc. Because we're going we're gonna to make use of all of that as we, um, as we start working on the DOM. All right, so let's just a quick tour of what I want to talk about today. So I'm going to break this up into a couple of parts and I'll do a few videos so that you can um, take a look at them as you have time. So the first one that I want to do is I want to talk about DOM programming in general. What is the DOM? Um, how, do we, how do we find things in the DOM? How do we create new things in the DOM? Remove things? How do we modify pieces of the DOM? In other words, how do we make the page do something um, other than what it looked like when we first uh, loaded it. So we're going to go through and look at a whole bunch of different objects and methods that we can use that are made available to us by the browser and we're going to use JavaScript in order to make that happen. So really what we're going to do is we're going to combine HTML and JavaScript together today and talk about how they interact. Um, so I'm going to go, I'll go through this and I'll talk about some examples in here. I want to show you a few things. In the second half of what I want to talk about, we have a big topic to discuss and that is I want to look at events. So web pages and JavaScript use an event driven programming model. So I want to introduce this idea and I want to talk about how you write event driven programs, how you understand and create um, event listeners. And then I will also build a program and try and show you a bunch of these things happening, how we can interact with them. Okay, so that's my plan for now. So let's let's start out and talk about this idea of the DOM. So previous to this, you've been building HTML pages and those pages have been static. In other words, they don't change. You create a web page like the one I have here. And this web page has um, a heading, a paragraph, an unordered list of items, and that's the web page. And if you load that web page, you're going to see all of those uh, elements. They're going to be rendered by the browser, and you're going to be able to, uh, to, to view them, but they're not going to change. So HTML is what gets sent to the browser, and the browser parses HTML in order to create a DOM tree. So the, the, the way that a browser thinks about the HTML that you send to it is as this hierarchical structure of nodes. So we have a tree structure where at the very top of this structure we have, in this case, an HTML element or a root element. So we have a, an inverted tree. So if you think of a tree going up and spreading out this way, we've just inverted that idea. And so we, we come from this root element and the root element splits out. So in the example that we have here, we have an HTML element, we have head and body. So the head and the body are the two children of the HTML parent node or this root element. And you can see that this structure just repeats. So the head is also, if I show you up here, you can see that the head element in our HTML has two children. It has a title and a meta. And you can see that reflected here in our diagram. So head is broken up further into title and meta. So the way that the browser thinks about what's going on in the web page is it thinks about it as this hierarchical structure of HTML elements and text. And so we, we call these nodes, nodes in a DOM tree. Some of those nodes have children. For example, HTML does, head does, body does. Some of those nodes don't have children. So some of those nodes are just going to end. Now, the diagram that I'm showing you here is a little bit simplified because the way that the browser sees it is actually a little more complex. And um, if you take this HTML that you have here for a paragraph element, for example, we have a paragraph element. And recall that when I say element, an element means not just this opening tag and not the closing tag, but it's the opening tag, all of the inner content 
and the closing tag. So all of that together is what we mean when we say an HTML element. So here you can see that our paragraph element has a text node, it has an anchor element, right? And it has another text node. So it ha it's actually more complex, but the idea is that these pieces of the HTML are gonna be parsed by the browser and they're gonna be used to generate this, this DOM tree, okay? So when we're talking about the HTML that gets sent to a page, we think about the HTML that you write. So if I were to right click on this page, I'm using Chrome here and for at least for today, I'm gonna to use the Chrome developer tools, but you can and should work with all different browsers. Sometimes I'll use Firefox or you might use Edge or Safari. All of them have equivalents to what I'm about to show you. So if I were to view the page source of this page, what I get back is the original HTML that was sent from the server to my browser, and this is what my, my browser has parsed in order to turn it into uh, in order to turn it into the DOM tree that we see right now. So this is a page just like you would write. Uh, we have a doc type, we have an HTML root element, we have a head element with meta tags inside it, a title, etc. Somewhere down here we'll have a body. Here's the beginning of the body, and on and on it goes with divs and paragraphs, h1, h2, etc. So this static HTML gets sent from the server to the browser. The browser parses it, renders it, and displays it in the page. But at that point, the page can do anything that you want. So you as a web developer are not limited to what that page looks like as it initially gets sent uh, down to the page. So I brought in another page to show you a simple example of a web page that looks very different than the one we just had a second ago. So this is a uh, the World of Meter page that has all kinds of statistics, world populations, births, healthcare expenditure, how many bicycles were produced this year, computers produced this year. And you can see that this page is constantly changing. So whenever you see a page that is changing like this, what you're seeing is you're seeing a programmer who has written static HTML, which gives the representation of the page, but then you also have some kind of JavaScript running. You have something that's allowing that page to constantly update the DOM and make it possible for the page to look different somehow. I mean, a really good example of what we're talking about here is if, if you open your email, so whether that's Gmail or Outlook or something through Seneca, and I open my email, those two web pages are gonna look very different because the email that I get and the email that you get are not the same. Obviously the data that goes to me and to you are different. So as a result, as a web developer, I'm gonna to have to build a base set of HTML which is suitable for everybody. But then as soon as it loads, I need to change what is visible. So as new mail comes in for you, I need to update the page and I need to make it possible for you to see, okay, there's other stuff that's going on there. So what I wanna do now is I wanna I want to switch views for a second and instead of looking at the source of the HTML as it was sent from the server, I want to now switch to think about what this looks like at runtime. So instead of the static HTML that was produced and sent and is never going to change, I want to think about, okay, what is the what is the current state of the page? For example, this page right now has a current state. It's always changing, but it is it has a state at any given time. That state is what is the DOM is is what we're looking at here. So let's take a look at this. Let me just switch views so I can make uh, let me do this. So I'm going to open up the inspector and I've just broken my inspector out into a separate tab. You don't have to do it this way. If you want to have your inspector be docked at the bottom of your, of your browser, you can. I'm going to break it out into its own uh, page because I want to be able to get a little bit more room to show you what's going on here. So when I open up the dev tools in Chrome, what am I seeing? Well, instead of seeing, this was the source that was, that was initially sent, what I'm seeing now is I'm seeing a representation of the DOM, this in-memory data structure 
which represents the page as it exists right now. You can see at the very top of this, I have my root element, my HTML element. And you see that every time I hover over one of these things, over here in the browser, it's going to show me this is the element that you're currently inspecting, or this is the element that you're pointing to right now. So this HTML element, instead of having a tree structure that looks like this, where it's going down, in the dev tools, it's going to do it sort of going deeper. So the tree is going to go from left to right. And you can see that inside my head, I have all of these different meta tags. So each one of these corresponds to what we saw over here. If I make this a bit bigger, you can see, for example, the title is here and the title is also here. So the title is in the DOM and that element has been placed in there, okay, inside the head. Inside the body, same kind of thing. I have all of these different elements. So as I move my mouse over these elements, you're going to see that they pop up corresponding one to one with what's actually in the page. So this thing that you're seeing here is flexible. It can be changed using JavaScript, using CSS. You can write code to make it do anything you want. So you send an initial set of HTML and then you can modify it at runtime and you can make it do, make it do new things. So how do we get access to this? How do we, how do we program it so that we can, um, we can make use of it? So I'm going to, I'm going to use the console, make this a bit bigger. I'm going to use the console here to try and demonstrate a number of the things that I want to do. And um, actually, maybe I'll show my console from, let me see if I can get the console here inside the same, yeah, that's probably better. Um, So here, I don't know if I'm going to be able to, I have to zoom out a little bit to make this work. There we go. I want to have, basically what I want is I want to have a console where I can write code. I want to have the element inspector here so you can see what I'm, what I'm talking about as we go along. Okay, so the main entry point that we have to the DOM is through uh, is through the global object in JavaScript. So JavaScript always has a, a global object whenever you're programming and you say, you know, for example, before we said array, right? Well, where did array come from? Array and all of these other things live on top of or live within this global object. And the global object in the browser is called window. So if I want to access anything in the scope of, of this window or in the scope of this web page, I can and I do that through the window object. So there's lots of things that you've been working with when, you know, if I say console, for example, where does it come from? Window.console is there. So this is how I get access to it. So whenever I say something like, if I say console, is the same as window.console, true. Those, are, those two things are the same. They refer to the same object. So if you don't put window, it's automatically going to assume that it's gonna go looking for something in the scope that you're at. And right now we're in the global scope, so it's gonna go and look for it in the context of the global scope. Okay, so what we wanna do is we wanna use window.document. So window.document is our entry point, or it's this object that allows us to access all of the different pieces, the programming pieces that we need in order to be able to work with this page, window.document. And based on what I just told you a second ago, if you said document, you know that it would work as well because document is the same thing as window.document. Okay, so you're going to see programmers sometimes say window.document and sometimes they're just going to say document and you'll understand, okay, that's the, the reason for these. Uh, we, can do, we can do either of them. So let's start with something simple. Um, here in my page, I have a title 
for this current this current page that we're working on web 222 you can see that the title shows up at the top of uh, my tab if i hover over it i can see it you can see the title is here web 222 week 7 web 222 okay so how how do i access that well i can say document dot title and it returns back to me this string and the string that i get back is whatever was in the title what whatever was parsed out of the html title attribute and it says okay here's here's what the title is now this property document dot title is readable but it's also writable So you'll notice that what's just happened here is my, my DOM, the elements inside of my page have changed. So the title element now has a new inner content called new title. And you can see that the browser, the browser says new title. And I can change that as many times as I want. So document, sorry, let me, document.title is equal to another new title and it changes again. So from JavaScript, JavaScript that's running in the context of this page, right now, let me just mention this in case it's not obvious, the JavaScript that I'm running at the moment is being run in the context of this web page, but I'm doing it in the console. I'm not, I didn't write a script that's inside here, but when you write code in the console, it's the same as if you had, um, JavaScript that was running in the context of this page. Okay, so what else can we do? Well, uh, let's take a look. We could say document dot body. Document dot body gives us a reference to the body element. And you can see that in the dev tools, it's actually returned the body to us. Here's the body. And so I have access to document dot body. I could say document dot images document.images, and it returns to me this thing that looks kind of like an array, but it's called an HTML collection. And you're like, what, where, you know, what is an HTML, what's an HTML collection? Window.html collection. So HTML collection lives on the window, and you can see, again, it's capitalized. So what's your guess about what type this is going to be? when something has a capital letter at the beginning like this, we assume that it is a constructor function. So here you can see that this is a constructor function and the code for this function is implemented in the browser. So it's native code. It's not something that's a script that we wrote. The browser is providing it, which is interesting. So some parts of the browser and some parts of these APIs that we're gonna be working on are gonna be written in JavaScript. Some of them are gonna be written in native code. So much of the browser is written in C++. And so this, fu this function, for example, could be written in C++ or it could be written in JavaScript. But we are gonna have access to it via the DOM. We're gonna be able to work, uh, work with these objects and con constructors and methods and so on um, via JavaScript. So this document.images has six images in it. And if I ask for the first image in that list, document.images at zero, it gives me back an image. And if I hover over it, it's this image right here. So you see that as I hover over it, it's showing me that this is the element that you're referring to, the first image. And this is the, this is the URL, this is the source for this, like so. And uh, this is the alt for this. So when we have, whenever we're calling these methods, when I say document.images at zero, I could do any of the things that you're used to doing with JavaScript that you've learned before. So one of the things that I want you to do is I want you to not panic as we start to add more and more methods, classes, properties, and so on. It's going to seem overwhelming because the DOM is enormous. There's so much to it, but you don't have to learn all of it right now. So we're going to work our way through it slowly. And everything you've learned about working with variables and arrays and objects and all of those things, all of it is important right now. So you, all of the things you know how to do. So for example, if I said to you, I wanna create a variable which has a reference to the first image on this page, what would I do? Well, 
we have to declare a variable. We need to give it a name. Let's say first image is equal to document dot images at zero. So I want to get a I want to get the reference to whatever this thing returns, and I want to store it inside first image. So if I say first image, first image refers to the object that was returned from the DOM. So instead of just being limited to working with numbers and strings and so on, now what we can do is we can start to work with elements in a web page. So I can start working with images and paragraphs and so on. So if I take this first image, what sorts of things could I do with it? Well, for example, you can see that the source of this image is this is what we're looking at right here. But could we do something could we do something like change the change the URL? So if you were looking at this code and I asked you to change the change the image that's being displayed in this page, how would you do it? You might say, well, I need to write an image source equals whatever the new URL is. The problem is that we're not currently working in HTML. What we're doing right now is we're working in JavaScript and we're using the DOM. So what I have to do is I have to take my first image and I have to reach into it and I have to access the property that I want to change. So remember, objects have properties. When we're working with an HTML element, HTML elements have references sorry have attributes and so the source attribute is how that you know um, so if I said dot source it returns back to me this is the source of uh, this image element but what if I said first image dot source is equal to this URL so you can see that I've been able to dynamically which which means I've been able to at runtime modify the web page which was represented by this source. So this source here is, let me see if I can find this image. So here's the image. This is the HTML that we're playing with right now. Let's find it over here. So um, inside h1, h1, inside this paragraph. Uh, let me figure out where this is. Dom tree. Dom notes. Yeah, here it is right here. Okay, so here's the image element. It lives inside this paragraph, and you can see that the source attribute has been changed. Let's change it back. First image dot source equals, and I'll set it equal to the original string. And if you watch right here, if you watch in the inspector, what you're going to see is as I press enter, it's going to flash. And you're going to see that the web page is going to respond immediately and the DOM tree is going to respond. So what you're doing is you're accessing this in memory data structure you're saying, I want to change a value that's inside of a, an object. I have an image object. I want to change the value that is attached to the source property. It's a string. It's a URL. And I want that to be something new. And when I make it something new, it loads this other thing. What if I made it, what if I made it equal to something that doesn't exist? Like, what if I uh, broke this? So what you can see now is that my image is broken. So it's done what I asked it to do, but there's nothing there to be loaded. So when it comes back, it says I can't. You can actually see the browser says I can't get this. I got a 404 trying to load this. So let's fix this. We get this, this proper image back again. OK. So what all can we do with the DOM? So remember, if I say the DOM, often what I mean is starting with the document. So doing something with, with the document. And if you just type document dot, you can look through and you'll see there's all kinds of, look at all of this, tons and tons of different properties, methods, objects, constructors, etc. that we can use. And this is just the beginning of it. So for working with all different aspects of the page and of the, 
of the browser, which I lost my console. Let me just pop this open again. Okay, so let me teach you how to do some more things. So, so far what we've been able to do is we've been able to do things like document.title and we've been able to ask for a couple of really specific things. But what we really need to be able to do is reach deep into the DOM tree and access something. Like what if I wanted to get access to a, a, a very specific paragraph element? Or what if I want to get access to all of the paragraph elements? How would I do that? So, uh, I want to teach you about a couple of methods for querying or it's almost like you're thinking of the DOM as a database and you're going to write a query to do this, but we're not going to use SQL. We're going to use another language. We're going to use a uh, query, query selector and we're going to use uh, CSS selectors to be able to find things in the DOM. But I have two methods that I want you to learn about and memorize how to work with right now. So the first one is called query selector and the second one is called query selector all. And the difference between the two is that the first one query selector is going to go and find an element in the DOM tree that matches what we ask for and it's going to return the first one that it finds. So query selector only returns one element. Query selector all is going to do the same thing, but if there's more than one, it's going to return a list. So I'm going to get multiple uh, items of these that are going to come back to me. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's say, for example, that I was interested in looking at image elements that are in this page. I want to try and pull image elements out of the DOM. So if I said document.querySelector image and I press enter, what it does is it starts by going into the DOM and it goes down and looks, starts traversing its way through the tree until it finds the first image element. And the first image element, as we know, is this one right here that we're looking at. So up above here, there's no other images. All the rest of this is text. But when we get here, this is an image. So if I were to change this and say document dot query selector all, and I said image, what it's going to do now is it's going to return to me a list. It's called a node list. That's the type of this. So it's not exactly an array. It's like an array, but it's a node list. And there's parts about what I'm going to teach you that are rooted in some very, very old parts of the web standards. So you have a thing that looks and feels a lot like an array, but it's not exactly an array. I'll show you how to overcome that problem later on. So query selector returned the first one. And query selector all returned six of these elements. If I were to get the first element out of the list, you'll see that the first element in the list that it's returned back to me is the same one that I was expecting. They both return, I, in both cases I get this first element, but I'm also getting access to all of the other elements. So for example, here's another one here. If I were to ask for the first element in here, you see that it's this image which is coming up right here, okay? So if I wanted to uh, work with this image, I can do the same thing. So let second image is equal to document.querySelectorAllImage and then take what is returned by that and get me the first element, uh, or sorry, the element at position one, second element from that list. So I say second image, and if I were to look, what does second image have? Well, second image looks like this we could work with second image. I could say second image dot width equals 15. And you can see that now this image is tiny, tiny, tiny. It's only 15 pixels wide, or I could say equals 150, or I could say it equals, you know, 1,500, right? So I have the ability to program that element, but before I could program the element or make changes to it, I had to find it. So when you want to find things, document.querySelector allows you to type in a selector. And so a selector is a string, and this string allows us to specify the elements that we want to get back when we uh, are looking at this page, okay? If I want to get more than one, I'm going to say query selector all, and that's going to return back to me a list, a list of these elements. Now. I also want to make you aware that there are some other older uh, methods that, that you'll sometimes see people uh, use. 
And um, I'll show you the difference between these, but I am going to suggest to you that you stick with query selector and query selector all whenever you need to find something in the DOM because you only have two methods you have to remember and they will work in every situation. Okay, so I'll, I'll show you examples of what I mean in a second. Uh, for now, let's, let's keep going. Let me talk to you about another aspect of what we're doing here. So far, I've been saying document dot query selector like so, okay? But I don't have to start at the top of the DOM when I'm doing my searches. So for example, um, I could have said document dot body dot query selector like this, okay? So if I wanna find all of the images that are in the body, I could do that. So what comes before query selector is some element that you want to begin searching in. It's a node in the tree. So if you are looking at the DOM tree and you say, I wanna start searching from here, or I wanna start searching from here, what you have to do is get access to a particular node. And once you have access to that node, then you can start searching down within it. So query selector and query selector all work on top of any node in the DOM tree, not just the top of the DOM tree, but it's common if you wanna begin from the top and do your search down to say, I wanna do my search um, starting at document. So the first selector that we have here, document.querySelector all image, this allows us to search by a tag name. So it doesn't have to be image, it could be anything. It could be paragraph. So if I say paragraph, there's 75 paragraph elements in this page, which isn't surprising. When you start scrolling through it, you can see there's all kinds of them. Or how many links are there in this page? 61. 61 links, uh, six images, etc. So I now have the ability to pull things out of the DOM based on the element type that they are. I want paragraphs, I want anchors, I want a table, I want, show me all the H1, uh, H1s, okay? There's two of them. Or show me all of the H2 elements, there's three of them. So we have, we have an easy way to query for specific elements that we want. What if I wanted the very first H2 in the document? document.querySelector h2. I'm using query selector because I want to um, just get back one of them. I want the very first one. And I might say that once I get this element back, I wanna put it into a variable. So I might say let first h2 equals the result of this. So first h2, and I could say that I want to scroll this element into view. So right now I can't see this element, but if I say first h2 dot scroll into view, the web page has, has moved so that my first h2, you'll see where it is, it's right there at the top. It's scrolled the page in order to get to that location. So that's interesting. First h2 has a whole, this element has an entire API that I can use, all kinds of things. If you scroll down through this, you can see all kinds of things you can do. A lot of these things we'll talk about. Many of them you'll use in follow-up courses or other things when you're building the web. So it's a really rich set of functions, properties, etc., that you can use for the, for the data that comes out of the DOM. Okay, so how else can we ask for things from the DOM? Another thing that we can do is we can ask for very specific pieces of information. So as an example, if I were to say document.querySelector all, and I look for all of the H2 elements, I want you to notice something about the way that these H2 elements were returned to me. So you can see it says H2, and then it has a hashtag from HTML to the DOM, H2, hashtag programming the DOM, H2 DOM programming exercise. So I wanna to talk to you about this part right here, the hashtag that comes after the H2. What is that? What's going on there? So this very first one, here's the, here's the element in the DOM. Take a look at what we see here. So we have an H2 element and the H2 element has an ID. So 
An ID on an element is a unique identifier within the DOM. So only one element in the DOM can have this particular ID. And we use this as a way of, it's almost like naming a variable in your code. You have something that you wanna be able to reference in JavaScript or CSS. So you need to name it. That's what they've done here. H2 ID equals from HTML to the DOM. So what if I was interested in querying for that exact piece of information? How would I do it? Document dot query selector. And think about this, is it query selector or query selector all? In the case of an ID, there's only ever gonna be one element that's gonna have that same ID. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use query selector. So I'm gonna say document.querySelector, and then the selector that I'm gonna give is not H2 because H2 is too general. I don't want any H2, I want a very specific element. The element that I want is from HTML to the DOM. And what I do is I put a hashtag in front of it. So when you see that hashtag, what it means is get me something with this ID. Okay, document.query selector hashtag is an ID. And I get back that exact same element that you can see right here. A minute ago, I told you that there are some old methods that you can use that do the same thing. So document dot get element by ID. That will also work. And in the notes, we talk about it. But if I were you, I would prefer query selector because query selector works for IDs, for tag names, for class names, for all kinds of things. Whereas this one is limited. This one only works when you want to get something by its ID. But often we're going to need uh, other ways to be able to work with this. And so I would say to you that a better option is to be able to say uh, to use query selector. But I want you to be aware of it because you're going to see people do it in their code. Okay, one more note. Let me let me say something about this. If I said document dot query selector um, from HTML to the DOM, you notice up here it says H two and then a pound sign. So when you're writing a selector, if I said H two, that's just a more specific query selector. So remember, if we said if we said H2, this means get me the very first H2 in this document, okay? Which just happens to be this one. If I say, um, if I say get it to me by this hash, it means get me the element that has this ID. It has nothing to do with being an H2. So when you're talking about IDs, IDs are spe specific to an element they have nothing to do with the type of the element. However, you can also combine these and you can say h2 pound from HTML to the DOM. And so this one means get me an h2 element that has an ID of from HTML to the DOM. Okay, I want to point this out not because uh, you're, you're usually not going to need to do this with IDs because IDs are, are unique. The type doesn't matter. But when you're working with classes, you're going to do it. And I also want you to understand what this syntax is that's being returned. So when I did a query selector all for all of the H2 elements, that's why it returned it in this format. So that's what you're seeing right here. Okay, so an, we, we have two ways of doing it. We can do query document, query selector, all. We can ask for, um, let's say all the spans in the document, query selector all span. We can ask for something by ID, right? Which we just saw, whatever, whenever something has an ID. But I wanna to talk to you about another way we can do this. So when, you're, when you are building your web pages, you're going to have lots of elements that don't have an ID. So for example, you can see that this H1 right here does not have an ID. So I can't query it by ID. This H1 isn't named. However, the one that comes after it, you can see that this H1 does have an ID here. So 
This one has an ID, this one doesn't have an ID. Sometimes, and an ID, just to review, an ID is unique in the document. You can't have that ID used more than once. But there's another case that's gonna come up a lot, and that case is the case where we want to have an element which is similar to another element in some way. We wanna put them together into a group. So if you think about students taking Web222, each student taking Web222 has their own student number. It's, it's an ID, it's unique. You have a student number and it's unique to you. However, all of the students who are taking Web222 are part of a class. They're literally part of Web222, whatever the section number is that we have for this particular course. So when we want to have something that is part of a class, something that is in a group that is related to other elements that are in a group, instead of using an ID, we can use we can use a class. And you can see you can see a class being used right here. So you can see that I have an anchor and the anchor, instead of having an ID, it has a class, anchor.js-link, okay? And if I scroll down through the DOM here, you can see that I have lots of classes. So for example, div class equals highlight, pre class equals highlight. Now this is really interesting. What I want you to notice about a class is that a class can live on any element and it's not specific to the type of the element. So this div and this pre element both share the same class. They're both highlight, okay? So what can we do with that information? How do we query for a class? So if I said highlight, that won't work. It won't work because if you just put a bare string like this, what it's looking for is it's looking for an element or a tag name that matches that, which isn't gonna work for us, okay? If I said image, it would work because image is a, an element name in the, in the document. But if I say highlight, it won't work. If I said highlight with a pound sign in, pound sign in front of it, it would mean get me an element whose ID is equal to highlight. Nothing's coming back, nothing has that ID. So what I need is I need another piece of syntax. I need to be able to reference by class and the way you do that is you put a period in front of it. So when you say period and then a string, what you're saying is get me all of the, all of the elements that have the highlight class on them. So if I do this, you can see that there are 82 elements that get returned to me. And if you look at this list, we have div.highlight, pre.highlight, div.highlight, pre.highlight. So just like you're seeing here, we have two elements and they both have highlight on them. We have divs and pre's, and that's what you're seeing here. Now, if I wanted to be able to reduce this set down, what if I only wanted the pre elements that have highlight on them. How would how would you go about doing it? We know how to get pre. <clears throat> Sorry. Pre. We know how to get pre. And we know how to get a class by putting a period. So if I wanted to get all of the pre-elements that also have the class highlight on them, I can combine that together when I'm writing my selector, okay? So we have a really powerful way to be able to query inside of the, inside of the page in order to get, um, to get elements by their ID, by their class name, by their tag name, etc. And the two that I'm recommending that you focus on are query selector, which is for returning the very first one, and query selector all, which is going to allow me to um, work with, uh, which will let me get a set, get all of the elements that are in there. Okay. Couple more things about working with these. So let me get this first, let me get this div right here. So if I said, um, 
let div is equal to document dot query selector. I want to get the first div that has a highlight class on it. So that's this div right here. Okay. So a couple of things that you can do with with this that are important for me to point out to you so you're able to when you're going to be going to program this stuff. So the first thing that you can do here is you can ask for the inner HTML of that element. Okay? So I want you to notice what we just got back. If I open up this div, you can see that inside the div there's a pre-rendered element, a pre-tag. Inside the pre-tag there's a code element. Inside the code element, there are spans. Uh, and you can see that this is interesting. This is how GitHub does all of their um, syntax highlighting on the web is they put spans around everything that they want to have a particular color. Like you can see UTF-8 is a string. And so they have class S, which is what is giving it the red color here. We're going to talk about that in the coming weeks when we do CSS. But when I say, when I have an element and I say inner HTML, what it's giving me is it's giving me everything inside of this element, like all of the content that's inside that element, okay? Another thing that I could do is I could say div dot inner text. And I want you to notice what we have now. This looks very different than what we just had a second ago. Just for comparison, I'll put them both together so you can see div dot inner HTML. So there's the difference between the two. So when you ask for inner text, what you're saying is, give me, a, give me an approximation or the rendered version of what this would look like. So this is the text that the user would see, but this is the inner HTML that is producing it, okay? So you have access to both of these things. When you wanna pull something out of a DOM node, you wanna get text out of it, you can ask for its once you get the, the node uh, and you have an element like a div, you can say, give me the inner text or give me the inner HTML for this element that I can work with. One more thing you can do is you could say, give me the outer HTML. The difference between outer HTML and, I'll just show you, inner HTML is that you can see that the div itself has been included. So it isn't here. This thing starts at the pre, but you can see, where does the pre? The pre starts right here in, in the other one. And so outer HTML includes the HTML for the element itself. Inner HTML is what's inside the element, but not including that element. And inner text is what is being rendered by that HTML, but it's not HTML. It's the, it's the content of what goes in there, okay? And these things can be changed. So if I said div.innerText equals hello world, that's what it does. It changes the element so that we have this, we have this instead. If I were to say, Div dot inner HTML is equal to bold. It's different, right? So now hello is being rendered using bold, right? So the HTML, if I say div dot inner HTML, so what we have here, the DOM gives us a really powerful way to be able to take a page and modify it at runtime. Now, one of the questions you may have been asking is, um, how is it possible that I can change this page? Like, am, have, I, have I ruined the page for everyone else that's gonna see this? And obviously the answer is no. If I reload this page, think about what's gonna happen. So all the changes that we're making right now, everything that's happening in the DOM is happening in memory inside this DOM tree and the DOM tree lives in my browser. So I am programming client side, I'm programming in the browser of the user, I'm not doing anything on the server side, I'm not changing the HTML. 
the HTML that gets sent is ex going to be exactly the same. So if I reload this page, you can see that everything's back to the way it was a second ago. So all I'm doing is I'm making, modif I'm making modifications to it right now live in the page, but I'm not, I'm not saving them as it were. So as you progress through your courses in 322 and 422, you're going to spend a lot of time learning how to make changes inside of the web page, dynamic changes like this, but then propagate those changes or send those changes back up to a web server so that the data gets saved in a database or in files or whatever, whatever method you're going to use uh, for keeping track of that stuff. Uh, while we're on this topic of um, query selector and we're working with this div here, let me just show you one other trick. So remember we said, if I said uh, document, dot query selector span, query selector all span, what does it mean? It means get me all of the span elements in this page and you can see that there are two, over 2,000 of them. There's a lot of spans in here. Now, what if I was interested in only getting the spans that exist inside of this element right here? What if I don't want all of them in the whole document? I just want, I want to get these ones. How would it be different? Well, I'd have to begin by getting access to this div right here that I want to work with. So let's do that. Let's say div is equal to document.querySelector. And I'm going to ask for a div that has the class highlight. OK, so I have this div. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that div and I'm going to say document.query, sorry, div uh, .query selector all span. So think about the difference here. Think about what just happened. In this case, I said start at the root of the document and traverse down through the document in order to find the elements that I'm interested in. In the second case, I said, I want to I want to begin from this node right here. I want to begin from this part of the DOM. I'm not interested in all the rest of it. I just want to zero in on this one spot and I want to move down through that. So you can see that instead of getting 2000 spans, I get 30 spans. So here are all the different spans that come up like so. Okay, so we have a way to query the DOM or to query a subset of the DOM to be able to ask for these nodes, get them back, and then to be able to make changes to them, uh, update them so that uh, they have some new text, new inner HTML, et cetera, that we wanna be able to change things at runtime um, that are different than what we sent to the user before um, when the page was originally built. Okay, so a couple more things I want to mention before I, I pause this first discussion of doing the DOM programming. And the next thing I want to talk about is so far we've only learned how to query or find things in the DOM, but what if I want to create new things and put them into the DOM? How would I go about doing that? All right, so the way that you make a new element, if I have a variable, let lm equals, and I'm going to say document dot create element. So let's say I want to make a span. When you say document dot create element, what it does is it creates a new instance of an HTML element or whatever particular kind of element you're working with. So it gives you an instance of an object and that object functions exactly like all of the other things we've been working with. So for example, what if I wanted to put some content into the middle of that element? How would I change the text that goes inside it? So all the same things we can do with an element um, that we pull out of the DOM, we can do it with an element that we create. 
So the difference between this span that I'm working with here and this span, for example, that's inside of the page here, is that this element hasn't been inserted into the DOM, okay? It only exists as a variable in my JavaScript. It hasn't been placed anywhere yet. So if I want to put this into the DOM, I have to ask the DOM to insert it or append it for me into a particular location. So the simplest way we could do this is, let's just throw it at the end of the page. So I'm gonna say document.body, and I'm gonna ask to append a new child element to the end of the body. So it needs, what, what do you want me to append? So I have to have an element that I've created, so in this case a span, and I'm gonna say, um, I wanna append my element that I just created above to the end of the document here. And I'm gonna scroll down so you can see the body. So here's the body here too. So if I press enter, you can see that what's happened is that it has placed this in the, in the bottom of bottom of the page. And if I scroll down, you can see that the text that I put in here is, is right here. If What would happen if I did element.inner text equals new text? You can see that it updates the DOM and it updates what you see in the DOM. And the reason that works is because we still hold a reference to this element. So even though it's been inserted into the DOM, we still have access to it just through JavaScript as a regular object. I could remove it from the DOM the same way that I added it. I could say, take this element and I want to remove it. And it's gone. So it's gone from here, it's gone from here. Element still exists, right? It's still, uh, it's just been detached from the DOM. So one of the things you're gonna do as a, as a client-side web programmer is you're gonna do lots of things where you'll generate content and then once you've created that content, you'll insert it into the page. So just as an example, let's say, let's do something a little bit bigger. Let's say we wanted to make uh, an image and let's say cat, I'll just, the name doesn't matter. So let's say I wanted to have an image of a cat and I wanna say this is going to be an image. This image, I want to have a width of 500 pixels. And whoops, sorry, cat. My cat has a width of 500. Uh, so if we look at cat right now, you can see we have a, an image element, it has a width, we might put an alt some alt text on it for accessibility. So cat dot alt equals picture of a cat. And we need a source. So I'm gonna say cat.src is equal to, and I'll use the same image I had a second ago. Okay, so now this is what my, my element is looking like, but it's not visible anywhere. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this, uh, I'm gonna take this, cat image and I'm gonna insert it into the DOM. So I'm gonna say document.body.appendchild cat. So give it the element that I wanna push into the DOM and it loads it and puts it down here. So I want you to see that you're not limited to the HTML that you write statically when you build your initial web page. That page can change at runtime as a result of writing scripts. Everything I've been doing today, just to try and familiarize you with this, has been about working with JavaScript in the console, and I'm working against a page that already exists, but what we're gonna move into is we're gonna write HTML plus JavaScript, and we're gonna have things happen dynamically at runtime where we generate lots and lots of content in the page based on interaction with the user or based on things happening in the operating system or in the browser or on timing and so on. So that's one of the things I wanna do in the, uh, in the next video. So I think I'll pause there. What I would encourage you to do is make sure if you haven't already go through the notes for working with the DOM, make sure you are comfortable knowing how to get access to 
all the different, I have lots of links to go to different references and things if you wanna look things up. Try some of what I'm doing right now. Um, I definitely don't want to encourage you to go and become a hacker in the sense of like trying to break things, but I definitely do want to encourage you to become a hacker in the sense that I want you to be curious. And every time you go to a web page and you look at something like the Wikipedia page, for example, um, open up the inspector, take a look at the elements that are inside the page, try and query for things, try and change things. Like if I said to you, could you figure out how to change this image right here to another image? What would it take to do that? Well, you definitely have enough knowledge from what we did today to be able to do that. So try playing around with this stuff, try learning it. In the next video that, that, we, uh, that I do, I'm gonna dive into talking about the section on events. And I'll talk to you about how the DOM functions as an event-driven programming interface, and we'll try and build uh, a, an app, a web application that uses some of those pieces. So I'll pause for now, and I'll see you in the next video.